So, we've established that the housing crisis is fixable, partly by But building stuff is controversial. People don't like construction. They think new buildings are ugly or blah, 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 blah. Actually, yes, new housing could be even better designed than it is right now. Let's talk about that. A big part of the debate around housing is tied to the construction, design, and appearance of the buildings. How a building relates to its surroundings is very important, and so is how it affects the broader environment, i.e. the surrounding city and even the global climate. Most cities employ zoning codes that restrict the type of buildings that can be built in a given area. This is a useful way to separate heavy industry from cities, for example. But in the West, over many years, bureaucracy turned racist policies into the ultimate nightmare for everyone. Brit Monkey explains this in more detail, but it was found that neighborhoods of exclusively detached houses will never be affordable to the <clears throat> lower income population. Today, across North America, the majority of urban land is zoned for unaffordable housing. Since any form of development is risky, and the most vocal opponents are in residential areas, the grand bargain came to be. Larger developers will exclusively work with low-density parking lots, commercial buildings, and sometimes single-family homes on busy roads, and aim to construct towers or mid-rise blocks, hopefully compensating for the long, expensive approval process by adding more units. In episode 4, We'll look at how your lovely townhouse project can skip being subjected to this. Uh, uh, ah! Next, I want to complain about something both invisible and visible. Complexity. Specifically, articulation, or as most people would call it, all those corners, bump outs, and roof bits. You've probably noticed how new buildings from the past couple decades look a lot messier. There's many cutouts, different materials, and a broken up form that often gets smaller with height. This style is the direct byproduct of recent Hansi regulations. For developments that need a rezoning, many municipalities include a design review. They usually request a stepped form and articulation, and a variety of cladding materials to break up the visual mass or perceived size of the building, or to create visual interest. They also liked stepped forms and the angular plane to reduce the impact of shadows. These sound good in theory, right? But no, they actively compromise buildings in multiple ways. Let's start with shadows. Oh my god, shadows! These dark shapes made by the sun, or lack thereof, do not work the way they do in renderings. They're usually highlighted in grey or dark grey, and the winter projections look dismal. But compare this to real life. Has anyone actually seen a shadow like this? In winters, clouds often diffuse sunlight, preventing shadows. Many of the residential streets we love are shaded in by trees. And with our changing climate, it's nice to have a shaded and a sunny side to choose from. So no, shadows aren't as much of an issue as we make them out to be. Especially alongside the housing crisis and the next issue. Efficiency. If they weren't built to marginally higher energy efficiency standards, today's buildings would likely be worse than their predecessors. This is because every additional corner and surface feature is a potential point of failure. In my script, it says, although construction sites try their best, but after hearing terrible things about the danger, hustle culture, and even abuse pushed by management, and for years seeing in dumpsters all the waste generated on site, I'm hard pressed to say anything positive about the North American building industry. In the coming years, we do need a revolution in building technologies, specifically around renewable materials, deconstruction and reuse, efficient self-regulating building envelopes like hempcrete, and much more. If knowing how much better we could do things is intriguing to you, I recommend Lloyd Alter's excellent articles on Treehugger. However, the housing shortage is about working with the systems we have in place to quickly address a global issue. So until this technological shift, we need to design our buildings with these inefficient work sites in mind. Most concepts depend on perfect execution. That's never gonna happen. We need simple, forgiving designs that are not only easier to build, but faster and thus more affordable. Presenting the dumb box. In other words, the kind of building European society has built for millennia. Buildings are not blocks that you can carve. They're complex systems. Complex shapes mean more reinforcement and more materials used. Uniformity is looked down upon and even considered ugly or monolithic. 
but this is more of a reaction to past architectural styles than hard fact. A skilled architect can use proportions and surface details to make a simple box look elegant. Whew, okay. Now that I'm done ranting about architecture, we need to talk about the D word. That's right. Density. A standard way of communicating how many people or units occupy a given space. In housing, it usually means a city is more compact and thus walkable, convenient, and affordable. For developers and housing advocates, increasing the density of an area is a standalone goal because it implies adding housing without further sprawl into valuable farmland and wilderness. On that note, housing is critical to fighting the climate crisis. Actively reversing sprawl by concentrating new housing in established areas is beneficial for the climate, our health and well-being, and your wallet. It's better to destroy five trees for a houseplex than it is to destroy 50 for a couple single-family homes. And of course, attached homes make better use of valuable resources and electricity. If you're a housing advocate, you're a sustainability advocate. I also must mention that towers, often perceived as the only way to achieve a high volume of units in a given area, are not sustainable in nature either. Concrete is a significant source of carbon emissions, and since they receive more sun and larger windows, they require more energy to heat and cool. Tall buildings aren't inherently bad, and thanks to the housing crisis, I shouldn't spend any time opposing them. Remember that people with opposing views can work together towards a common goal. My point on towers is there are other ways to achieve density. Paris gets right up there with only mid-rise blocks for the most part. European cities enjoy huge parks and backyards right from their apartments thanks to perimeter blocks. Montrealers have their row houses. Most North American cities, on the other hand, have desolate downtowns encircled by miles of inefficient, boring suburbs waiting for more density, more life. And if you're a planner or an architect, you should be aware of this huge opportunity that lies ahead of us. This word, density, has been weaponized by NIMBYs, people opposed to development in housing. It's been confused with the concept of crowding, which is actually reduced by more units as people have their own rooms to go to, and it's decreed as a strain on municipal services and roads, although the opposite is true when we look at the cost of running utilities to single-family homes in comparison to the amount of taxes they pay. In the next video, we'll look at NIMBYs and how you can fight for more housing in your city. Have you been criticized for er, advocating for increased density? Try terms like allowing more housing, providing housing choices, and letting people live in the area. Have you been harassed online for using terms like density? Have you tried going outside?